started. So the recording has started uh, so we can focus on our YouTube channel. Uh, thank you all for coming this evening. My name is Sebastian Alls. I'm one of the board members uh, for Community Alliance for Better Government, uh, who's hosting this event. Uh, we do have some feedback if uh, somebody could mute. Hopefully that solves any feedback. Perfect, that looks like it did. Um, again, my name is Sebastian Nalls. I'm one of the board members for CABG. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, and we're here to talk about ranked choice voting. Uh, ranked choice voting um, is a system of voting that will be coming up on uh, this upcoming November ballot, I believe, um, as a referendum. Uh, and this would apply for Evanston local elections uh, going forward. Uh, and transform the way that we do local elections here in Evanston. Uh, this has been something that has been implemented in a couple of municipalities uh, around the nation. And uh, Evanston is one of the first, if not the first uh, municipalities uh, in, uh, in Illinois to, to look at something like this. So we have two folks today that are gonna come in and uh, talk about ranked choice voting, approval voting, some of the pros and cons of both, uh, and answer any and all questions that uh, that pertain to this. Uh, this isn't a debate or anything like that, that this is a, a panel discussion, um, essentially hoping to educate folks uh, on this new uh, system of voting. Uh, I do wanna talk a little bit and, and plug CABG, Community Alliance for Better Government, on some of the stuff that we do. Uh, we work on electing, supporting a uh, responsive, transparent city government, uh, creating actions to increase input among Evanston officials, staff, and residents, improving racial diversity, equity, and inclusion, and encouraging citizen involvement in civic affairs. So a little bit of what we're doing here tonight uh, is based on uh, the work that we've done so far, uh, and we're always looking for new folks to join. Uh, we have a uh, few of our board members here tonight, uh, as well as our new president, Leslie Williams. Uh, congratulations to her. Uh, so we will be putting information about CABG, um, how to join, how to get involved, uh, some of the meetings that we do, and any other signups that we have. Um, and now I'll introduce our two panelists. Uh, we have Larry Garfield, who's here to talk about ranked choice voting. Uh, he's, he's been a sort of a renowned expert here in Evanston and has definitely been doing a lot of work with it. Um, and I have the pleasure of sharing the stage with him tonight. We also have a CABG board member, uh, Nick Korznowski, who's here to talk about approval voting, some of the pros and cons of ranked choice voting, uh, and, and how it's been implemented uh, across the US and other, and other voting systems. Uh, so I will, I will let Larry take it away. He'll start his presentation. Nick will follow, uh, and then we'll move to Q&A from there. So thank you. Okay, give me just a second here. All right, everyone can see slides, right? Well said. I'll take silence as a yes. <clears throat> so, hello everyone. Uh, let's talk about voting. Let's talk about the state of the nation. Sad truth today is that this country is just too polarized. And doesn't matter what your politics is, you know, the, the politics of America are broken at many, many levels. And if this resonates with you, the statement resonates with you, guess what? You're not alone. 86% of the country thinks government is broken. Public trust in government is near historic lows. Basically, the only thing we can agree on is that we can't agree on things. We are very clearly a divided nation. And as a famous Illinoisan once said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this that we go into, but there's one in particular that is just mechanical. The way we vote itself encourages division. The way we vote today in most of the country is called plurality voting. And it means that to win, you need to get more votes than any other candidate, even if that's not a majority. You just need to get 
more than any other individual person. That means as a voter, you have to think about, does my candidate have a chance of winning? Or am I just wasting my vote supporting someone who isn't going to be one of the top candidates anyway? As a candidate, you're not thinking, how do I reach out to the most number of voters? You're thinking, what is the least number of voters I need in order to win? And the best way to do that is to have a villain. You want to present yourself as the person most likely to defeat that terrible person over there, whoever that terrible person is for whatever definition of terrible. And so you're forced into a lesser of two evils model. The voting system itself encourages that. In every election, we see the same thing. You see Republicans saying, don't vote for that evil, that libertarian candidate. You'll just split the vote and the evil Democrat will win. Or you know, on the liberal side, don't vote for the Green Party. You'll just split the vote and that evil Republican will win. Whichever side of this you come down on, this is a bad way to go about running a campaign, how to run a government. But when there's only two candidates that are really viable, your best strategy is to go negative, to make your opponent look like a terrible human being, and you are the only one you can protect against that terrible human being. And this is just a terrible way to run a government, a terrible way to run a society, where the structure of the system itself encourages you to be a jerk to other people. In a plurality system, your best strategy isn't to look good, it's to make your opponent look worse. Now we've talked about you know, partisan questions here, but this doesn't just apply to partisan questions. One of the best examples here, 2019 Chicago mayoral election, they had 14 candidates. And <clears throat> in the first round, nobody cleared even 20%. Everyone had some support, but no one cleared even 20%. Now, in Chicago, Chicago's case, they had a runoff between the top two candidates, which means you had two candidates with about a third of the vote together running against each other. Two thirds of the voters wanted someone other than these two as their preferred candidate, and these, this is all they get. Voter turnout also fell in that election, and running that second election cost an extra $3.3 million. Closer to home here in Evanston. <clears throat> uh, we also have this two-stage process right now where we have a general election and may or may not have a primary. And in um, the 2017 mayoral election, we had five candidates running for mayor and no one got a majority. So the top two went to the general election for runoff. Fine, but look at the voter turnout nearly twice as many people came out to vote in the general than in the primary, which means half the voters didn't get a say in who those finalists were going to be. Do they even realize the primary was happening? This, this is not great. This process is not democracy. We have to do better. We can do better. The better way is ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting has been gaining the popularity uh, across the country for many years now. It's now used in uh, two states for uh, all their elections. Several states use it for primaries. Some use it for overseas and military ballots. <clears throat> um, a few other states in our using you know, uh, the Virginia Republican primary uh, this past year also used it um, for their elections. This is an older map. About 50 cities around the country are now using ranked choice voting, or I either have used it or have approved it to start using it. This has been growing dramatically in popularity around the country. So how does it work? Instead of voting for one candidate and done, you can rank your candidates, first choice, second choice, third choice, and so on. <clears throat> and then you don't have to think about which candidate is most likely to beat the candidate I hate. We then count the first place votes only and see, does someone have a majority? Under the current system, plurality voting, Daffy Duck would win here, even though a majority of voters voted for not Daffy. With ranked choice voting though, we have people's backup vote, their second and third choice. So we can eliminate the last ranked candidate and count those voters second place choice instead. 
And still, no one has a majority. So do it again. And now we're counting people's second or possibly third place vote. And we see we're, people are starting to consolidate. The, the not Daffy people are starting to consolidate here around Bugs Bunny. And finally, when you keep eliminating candidates who we know are not going to win, everyone's vote still counts. And the result is that Bugs Bunny is the winner. Now, this is actually unusual. In the majority of cases with ranked choice voting, the person who wins in the first round also wins in the last round. This is not about changing who wins as much as it is about changing how they run and how they win. <clears throat> ranked choice voting means that you can vote for a candidate, not against a candidate. It means that you can have more than two viable options in an election without having to worry about splitting the vote. You also don't need to worry about runoffs. This makes the process simpler in many areas, depending on who actually pays for the elections, it makes it less expensive. <clears throat> it means that as a candidate, being a jerk to other candidates is gonna backfire because you want to be people's second and third place choice. And we see this in practice. In New York City, they ran a ranked choice voting election in 2021 for the first time. And of people who saw that there was some kind of change in the tone, overwhelmingly, they felt it was a more positive campaign. Minneapolis has been using ranked choice voting for a couple of years now. And there was relatively little elbowing and attacking because every candidate wanted to be the second choice of their opponent's supporters. In Alaska, where they uh, are using a ranked choice voting for the first time this year, <clears throat> leading up to the election, um, one of the candidates said, as opposed to worrying about my primary and having someone outflank me on the right or on the left, now I can think about good policy because I'll be rewarded for that. A winning strategy for an incumbent under ranked choice voting is simply do a good job and serve, serve your constituents. That's the best strategy for an incumbent is do your job well. It's easy. Overwhelmingly, in areas that have ranked choice voting, voters understand it, they get it, they rank multiple candidates. You're not required to, but most do. And people want to keep using it. <clears throat> it tends to help uh, get a more diverse set of candidates too. People of color, women run more under ranked choice voting and they win more under ranked choice voting. Areas with ranked choice voting tend to see elected uh, city councils or legislatures that more closely match the actual population. Why is that? It's a couple of reasons. One, it removes uh, preliminary elections, which often have lower minority turnout. It also discourages negative campaigning and avoids vote splitting, which you know, both of which would uh, often impact non-conventional candidates more. Again, looking at New York, the candidate who came in third, okay, she didn't win, but she was still a fan of ranked choice voting. Many black leaders expressed their fear that RCV would split the black vote and none of the black candidates would win. That didn't happen. And in fact, black candidates who run against other black candidates have higher win rates in RCV elections because that vote splitting problem disappears. We also saw this in the Democratic uh, primary in 2020 for the presidency. You had Bernie Sanders supporters and Elizabeth Warren supporters fighting each other and saying, oh, you need to, you know, your candidate needs to drop out because you're just splitting the vote. When they worked very close on issues, they should have been working together, not against each other. That's what ranked choice voting enables, is candidates working together and putting out joint campaign ads, endorsing each other. These are things we see happen. Of the various uh, alternative voting systems that are better than plurality, which is most of them, RCV by far is the most widespread with the most existing adoption. Ireland and Australia have been using it for a century now. There are 50 jurisdictions in the US that have been using RCV at some point over the last 20 years. <clears throat> RCV does not have what's called the later no harm problem where ranking uh, more candidates ends up hurting the candidate you favor. Some election systems, that is a problem. Ranked choice voting, that problem is not there. We get a richer data set because we know this is a person's preference. This is their next preference. This is their next preference. So even if 
candidate X wins, we can still look at that full data and say, oh, candidate X won, but there's a lot of support for candidate Z as well. This is useful to know. Whereas right now you're kind of forced to say, I, I like Z, but I hate Y, so I'm gonna vote for X. And then the fact that you like Z disappears. Ranked choice voting doesn't have that problem. Ranked choice voting also requires core support, meaning that whoever wins has to actually have, they have to be someone's first place choice. Almost always in a ranked choice election, the person who wins is one of the top two candidates in the first round. So you're not very, you're really not gonna get the most vanilla, milk toast, boring, least offensive candidate that everyone is kind of met on winning. It's a candidate who actually has to stand for something and have real supporters. Now, no voting system is absolutely perfect. We know this, it's you know, been shown mathematically, no voting system is actually perfect, but we have enough experience with ranked choice voting. We know it's edge cases and we know that they are extremely, extremely rare. <clears throat> if this sounds good, we agree. Let's get ranked choice voting in Illinois. And let's start with Evanston. Why? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, as I mentioned, Evanston has this weird election system where we have a general election, but depending on the number of people running, we may have a primary and the number of people you need to cause the primary to happen depends on which, rate, uh, which office it is. And depending on what happens in the primary, we may actually cancel the general. So we may actually have a ranked choice, a, a, a multi-candidate election with fewer people in the primary and then the general, which doesn't happen. So people who were just waiting for the general don't get to vote and just, I'll be honest, I didn't even realize how messy this system was until I started looking into ranked choice voting and realized just how bonkers Evanston is right now. With ranked choice voting, much simpler. One day, one election, all the candidates and one clear majority winner. Same process for all offices. <clears throat> the other reason, cities are a good place to start. In Portland <clears throat> in Maine, they adopted ranked choice voting in 2010 and they liked it so much they expanded it to uh, all of the city offices. And then Maine followed suit in 2018 and then expanded it even to presidential elections as of 2020. So if we want this in Illinois, then Evanston can be a pioneer for it. We've talked, you know, there actually is a bill in the state's Senate for ranked choice voting, and it's sitting in committee, that's fine. Several of the uh, representatives and senators have said they like it, but they want to see real demand for it. Having a city adopt ranked choice voting itself gets their attention. So how do we make this happen? It's already on the ballot. If you like this, vote yes on the ranked choice voting referendum in November. If you want to uh, really push it, come join Fair Vote so we can canvas and phone bank and make sure people are aware of it, tell your friends. And this is a, a grassroots campaign to improve the way elections work in Evanston and thereby the whole state. So if this sounds good, you can sign up for our mailing list, volunteer. As I said, we need uh, people to help Canvas and phone bank. Follow us on social media, spread the word. Have us come speak to your uh, other organizations as well. Let's make voting better for Evanston, for Illinois, and for the whole country. Thank you very much. You, Larry, really appreciate that break and breakdown. It was fantastic. So now we are going to move on to Nick. Nick is ready. I'm about to go down to you, and I will give you those privileges. All right. Let me see if I can't completely screw up sharing my screen. There, everyone. Hopefully, everyone can see. You are all good. All right. So we're just going to go over some arguments there are against ranked choice voting. Um, again, like Sebastian said, not to make a debate out of this or anything, but just to inform. Um, these are sort of the top arguments that you would hear um, from an opponent to ranked choice voting. 
Uh, the first one is confusion. Um, and it's interesting because proponents of ranked choice voting say that what we have right now is a very confusing system. But confusion is really the number one argument you'll hear against ranked choice voting. The reason for that is, I think, best explained just by talking about how it would look in Evanston if we implemented it. Um, nothing would really be any different for you unless there were enough candidates to cause a primary, in which case you would all of a sudden vote differently and see a ranked choice voting system. The argument there is that sort of a arcane sounding alteration to something that didn't possibly seem broken already. Um, so the argument goes. The next thing would be that there would be fewer progressive candidates. The way that argument works is that because you need to be running to be somebody's second choice, you need to be running to somebody who you might disagree with and their voters. And so you might actually kind of rein in just how far from center you're really willing to speak to um, just because you might turn off a second or third choice voter. If that's on your mind and it's on everybody's mind running, you may not really get a whole lot of space to talk very far away from the center regardless of your, your ideologies or your politics. So the argument goes. A third argument would be that you'd have less informed voters. Um, and this is sort of an argument in favor of primaries. So it's not directly applicable in all cases to Evanston's municipal elections. But the argument there is that a primary sort of lets you kick the tires on your candidates, get to know who they are. And so by the time the general rolls around, folks are more familiar with the you know, policy stances and who this person is and all of that good stuff. And you would just not have that opportunity in a ranked choice system. Um, also the notion that it wouldn't cause change. So in the same way that confusion works as an argument that, hey, I'm not gonna really see any difference unless this one strange occurrence happens, could also be an argument to say, this won't do anything. This isn't going to change a ward election between a couple of folks the way that it might change a, a statewide election or something like that. Uh, and then finally, the delays in tallying, um, because you, you have to actually centralize all of this to in order to do, you know, this person's uh, number one came in last, we got to reallocate, all of that needs to be done in a central location. Um, and therefore, the actual results could be delayed, uh, which irks folks. Um, so those are more or less the biggest arguments that you'll encounter against ranked choice voting. I hope I'm putting it in some context for Evanston specifically to help you along. Um, and obviously Q&A will come later. Um, there is, uh, Sebastian, do you want me to go right on to it? There is an alternative system that we're going to talk about tonight called approval voting. Um, and a few things about it, you know, what is it? Uh, you can vote for as many candidates per race as you like, instead of you have to vote for, you know, choose one for mayor or something like that. Vote for however many you'd like. Same system that uh, the church used to elect the Pope for like more than 300 years. I don't know why they stopped doing, but like this was good enough for them for a very long time. The UN Secretary General is selected this way as well. Um, and the idea there is that you sort of, um, you can use the system to sort of see where support lies and narrow folks down to a smaller uh, pool in that way. Um, right now in the US, in the US, I'm sorry, it's only in place in Fargo, North, North Dakota. Um, I believe this is their first time they're, they've used it last time, I think in 2020, um, which is also when St. Louis just passed it for their municipal voting. Um, so that's sort of what approval voting is in a nutshell. It's a little different than ranked choice. Um, and of course it's not without, it's detractors. Uh, I would say sort of the same thing that a ranked choice voting detractor would say that you're really only going to get a centrist candidate here um, because you're essentially just counting how many votes everybody got. So you're not going to get the most votes on one end of the spectrum. You're going to get the most votes along, along the center. Um, the approval voting folks that I have seen just sort of in... You know, I'm no expert, but in, in my light reading, they actually seem to sort of lean towards this argument as a 
as a good thing for approval voting, but I'm it's not like a widespread thing, but it it should be noted that some advocates of approval voting also say this. Um, and then finally, that you could have a winner emerge that just wouldn't have otherwise. Um, and I, I was so worried about not getting the details on this before we started the, the video, but Alaska is having a special election tonight and it is the first time they're using ranked choice voting. There are two Republicans and a Democrat. If the Democrat comes in third, there's no Democrat on the ballot in November. So a winner may emerge that otherwise would have not emerged because you would have had that Democrat on the ballot. Um, that's the same sort of thing that approval voting sees as an issue with them, is that in the same way that you would have a centrist candidate, you may just shut out whole swaths of the electorate this way. Um, so sort of sort of an unspoken concern about ranked choice, but it's primarily seen as an argument against approval. Um, and so that's approval voting. That's the arguments against ranked choice voting. I super hope that um, I've made things more clear than they were before. And, uh, and I'll give it back to you, Sebastian. Nick, that was great. Uh, and again, thank you, Larry, for your previous presentation. Both presentations were absolutely amazing. Uh, and I am thankful to both of you uh, for taking the time. So we will now shift over into some q and I know that there's some questions that are in the chat. I have some questions uh, that I came up with uh, myself as well. Uh, and we'll just start off with one of those. Uh, so let's focus on Evanston uh, to start off this discussion. Um, we've seen in our city that communications with residents can sometimes be there, sometimes they're not. Uh, that sometimes residents don't get the news that they need to receive. Uh, so what do you two believe are some efforts that Evanston should take to help educate voters uh, with any change uh, in voting systems, not just ranked choice or approval voting, because uh, as both of you have, have noted, it's integral uh, for voter understanding when actually going to the ballot box. If they don't know how to operate these voting systems, uh, you know, any change that is implemented is all for naught. Uh, so, so either one of you can go first. Uh, I'll let you all take it away. So I completely agree. Uh, voter education is important in any election process, regardless of the election mechanism. Places that have already adopted ranked choice voting already have experience with a voter education, and we can and should lean on what they've done, learn from uh, their experience. I would suspect that includes uh, direct mailing to all registered voters with, you know, we already often do that, um, <clears throat> but just, you know, here's how the ballot will work. Here's an explanation of it. There are a ton of existing resources online that the city could use for a uh, city hosted website. There's uh, brief educational videos that are like a minute or two long. Um, so I think a combination of good online resources and direct mail is probably where we'd start. But again, let's look at what New York did. Let's look at what Santa Fe did. Let's look at what Minneapolis did. And if it worked there, it'll probably work here. Yeah, I definitely agree with the the direct mail piece. I would imagine that it would be it would be expensive and it would be something that would take a lot of time. But off the top of my head, if there was a monthly piece of mail until the election, you know, a mayoral email like what we got today with city manager, Facebook, all of that stuff. And if that if that was just consistent for a very long time, I think that would be sort of um, a cornerstone to any successful program for this. Um, I mean, you could you could even get right down to putting stuff in, um, in storefront windows about it. You know, I mean, there's really no limit to what the city could do. Um, but I think, you know, like Larry said, I think direct mail would be a huge piece of that. And uh, I want to take a slight shift and uh, talk about another um, alternative voting system and get both of your thoughts on it. Uh, so there's another voting system that's called STAR. 
Uh, it's the idea that uh, essentially voters are given a score or ratings on a ballot um, where each voter scores a candidate number zero through five, where zero represents the, the worst you know, a candidate can possibly be and five being the, the highest or the best. Uh, then those sums are scored uh, and then the two highest scored candidates are selected uh, as finalists. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts, uh, if you have any, uh, how would this compare to either of the voting systems that you brought forward or the voting systems that we have now? Nick, you wanna take this one first? Yeah, sure. Um, I don't really see the star system as being fundamentally dissimilar from ranked choice voting. I mean, you're giving people points, so you might as well be ranking them. Um, the difference, of course, is that you could have two fives show up on the ballot or something like that. Um, but I would think that just because they're, they hew so near to each other that the same pros and cons would largely translate. Um, I mean, Larry, shoot me down, tear me to shreds, but that's sort of my my first I'll, bluff at it. I'll be more polite than that. Don't worry. Um, so star voting, I would say, is still an improvement over plurality. Almost anything is, is an improvement over plurality. But star voting and approval voting both fail the, um, the what was the term I used before, uh, the harm last, uh, har harm later criteria. So imagine you've got a, a race and it's going to be close. And you know you have your preferred candidate that you like the most, whoever it is, and another candidate that you'd be okay with. In rank choice voting, you can vote for that preferred candidate first and that okay with second. That okay with second does not harm your first candidate. In either star or approval, voting for your preferred candidate, and then also giving points to another candidate, boosts that other candidate relative to your preferred candidate. So you do end up voting against yourself in some situations. Um, that's a problem that STAR has, uh, it's a problem approval has, it's not a problem with ranked choice voting. And right now, what I'll do, I'll shift over to some of the questions that have popped up on the chat. And if we're running low on questions, I have a couple more that are saved up uh, in the back so we don't exhaust all of them right now. Uh, so I'll start with this first one. Uh, I understand that there are or there is a much higher percentage of spoiled ballots uh, in, in ranked choice voting. Um, do you know what the percentage is? Uh, how would that compare uh, to Morality, approval, et cetera. So I don't think that there is actually a substantial difference in the st studies that usually get cited for that. They're referring to, oh, there was a 30% increase, I'm not sure the exact number, in the number of spoiled ballots. That sounds like a lot, but we're talking about the change from five to seven or eight in a district with hundreds or thousands of ballots cast. So statistically, it's still almost the same, um, at least from the, the numbers I've seen. So would, and anytime you're looking at that data, you have to keep in mind, uh, in, interpreting statistics takes context. Um, so if, yeah, from what I've seen, the error rates with ranked choice voting is about the same as plurality, especially if there's a good voter education effort. Um, certainly, that's what we've seen in uh, more recent cities like New York that have adopted it. Another question being, would this change in Evanston include school districts uh, and their elections, or does this just focus on uh, aldermanic candidates, mayoral candidates, et cetera? It's just municipal elections, so alderman, uh, city council, uh, clerk, and mayor. That's what Evanston has the jurisdiction to do itself. Uh, school board has a different process. Illinois' multiple layers of government are all kinds of weird. Uh, so you'd need a different organization to approve uh, putting something on the ballot for that, um, that office. Uh, so one step at a time. 
you know, this a referendum is just Evanston municipal offices. There's another question, and this honestly goes great with a question uh, that I had listed, so I'll pair the two up together. Uh, so obviously, large amounts of money in politics can definitely influence elections. Um, how does approval voting, rank choice voting, how do these alternative systems uh, either lessen that impact or exaggerate? Uh, that impact. Nick, do you want to take this one first? So I'm not monopolizing it. I can't answer it. I just want to be polite. So um, you're 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 the one with the slideshow, right? Like you're going to talk to me about this. Um, I'm. I actually, you know what? I think you you'd be better served to speak with the full okay. time. You're not monopolizing anything. Where you're the expert on this. Okay. Um, so yes. Private money in politics is a problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, there are lots of problems with our political system. Plurality versus ranked choice voting is just one of them. They all should be addressed. That said, uh, ranked choice voting helps at least some. For example, um, a unfortunate tactic that has been used uh, a couple of times by both Republicans and Democrats is to fund a challenger, a primary challenger, or an independent candidate uh, that's close to the other party to try and split that vote. And that's a place that just having money, you can throw out an extra candidate to be similar to the candidate you don't like, uh, and therefore force a split of the vote. Unfortunately, right now, kind of works. Ranked choice voting, that doesn't work anymore as a negative strategy. So having money to throw at that strategy doesn't get you anything. Ranked choice voting also means that um, candidates who are not one of the top two still have a reason to be listened to. Uh, personal example here. In 2020, my brother ran for state legislature. Uh, it was an open district, uh, Dem Democratic primary. And there were five candidates. One of the candidates got a lot of money from the governor. The other candidate or another candidate got a lot of money from uh, the mayor. And so the media just kind of ignored everybody else because, oh, of course it's going to be one of those two candidates because it's always one of two candidates and the money has decided who those two candidates are going to be. Therefore, no one cares about anyone else. With ranked choice voting, one of those two candidates would probably still have won. And sadly, my brother was not one of them, but it gives you a reason to look at those other candidates and what they're saying, because they can still influence the race. In that particular election, nobody had a majority. And the number of votes that the third, fourth, and fifth can ranked candidates had together were twice the spread between the top two candidates. So, you know, if, would paying attention to those candidates have changed the result? Maybe, we don't know. So yeah, ranked choice voting does not eliminate the influence of money in politics, but it does kind of soften the blow a bit uh, in some situations. Hopefully that's not too long of an answer. That's a great answer. Um, so I've noticed too, uh, especially with ranked choice voting, um, that tabulating this information is, or this, this voting data uh, is, can definitely be complicated can require you know, complex algorithms because it's not as simple as just counting votes. Uh, and does that leave the possibility that that would require higher costs, higher wait times for, for votes? Uh, and do you think that could possibly even uh, compare it to the costs of having uh, a normal primary consolidated election like we have now? I'll go first this time if you want. Go for it. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I would say that advocates of um, approval voting would see this as a wedge for them, that um, because ranked choice voting needs to be tabulated centrally, that again, from what I was presenting, it it's a common argument against the system because of cost overruns for the delay and all of that. Approval voting as an example of an alternative 
you're just counting votes like normal. There's just more votes to count. So you run it through the machine, whatever, right? Like the, your tabulation is a normal process. It is not extended in a similar fashion to ranked choice voting, which means it doesn't cost the city more to perform it. It doesn't take longer to do. You don't need as many people doing it, all that stuff. Is that's how an argument against ranked choice voting would go in that way in favor of approval voting, if you were an advocate of that. Um, and Larry, go on ahead. Yeah, so ranked choice voting can take a bit longer to count up all the results and get a final answer. By a bit longer, we're talking about at most a day, probably, to which I don't care. I mean, getting an answer 10 minutes after the polls close is useful for media that really wants people watching TV as though it's a horse race, but it doesn't actually add anything to democracy. I'd rather take an extra couple of hours and get a richer set of information and candidates that have broad support. So the extra time, I don't care. Really, I just don't care. In terms of cost, you may need to pay you know, election workers a little bit longer to do that extra counting, but one uh, that is still gonna be far less than an extra three and a half million dollars, uh, which is what Chicago spent on their runoff. And quite frankly, we need to pay election workers more as is. So, you know, this is democracy. If we have to increase the budget by five, 10% for staff, that's absolutely worth it. That is money well spent. Can we also add, I understand ranked choice vote typically limits itself to three rankings, not three candidates though. Uh, in the interest of saving space on the ballot, uh, this seems like a possible downside of ranked choice voting. Uh, Larry, do you want to talk about that? Possibly, Nick, yeah, possibly some jurisdictions. Um, yeah, you know, some jurisdictions will limit the number of ranks you can cast. Usually, it's either three or five. There's nothing inherent in ranked choice voting that requires that. Uh, usually, the argument is um, voter exhaustion. You know, that if there's ten people running, I don't want to think about all of them. But yeah, the answer is, okay, let people rank up to five, which would cover pretty much like almost every election with ranked choice voting that's ever been had. Um, it would be successful that way. In Evanston, I can't remember if we've had a race with more than five candidates. So yeah, go ahead and make it five or unlimited. Uh, there's, there's nothing magic about three. It's the places that have done that occasionally have problems. They should just use five instead, problem solved. I would also add um, <clears throat> that um, approval voting would take up just as much space because you're allowed to pick multiple candidates. So uh -huh. it's it's not something that one system is going to benefit from that we've talked about tonight. See what other questions we have. Uh, are there communities that have tried and then dropped ranked choice voting? And how does the switch to ranked choice voting generally affect turnout? So two separate questions there. The, I'm aware of only one jurisdiction in the last 15 years that has gone to RCV and then dropped it. That was Burlington, Vermont. And there's a story there. They had a very close race with, uh, for mayor under RCV with three candidates who came in almost tied not quite tied to the process, still elected a uh, candidate. After elected, that candidate became, or that new mayor became wildly unpopular, got mired in scandal um, and so on, which RCV is not gonna protect you against everything. No system will. And so there was a big pushback against ranked choice voting because baby with the bathwater, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater uh, kind of problem. Most of that coming from the home base of one of the candidates who lost that election. And so in the next election, with a very, very low turnout, relatively speaking, they voted to uh, rescind ranked choice voting. And then later in 21, 2021, voted to bring it back because they realized that was actually a bad idea. Ranked choice voting wasn't the problem. We should bring it, bring it back. So um, the, the rates of people keeping RCV is very, very high. As far as voter turnout, the data on that is a little bit mixed, but the overall consensus seems to be it's either 
unaffected or slightly raised. But it's really hard to dis disentangle that from all of the other things that impact turnout, like who's running in presidential election? Is it a, you know, who else is being elected at the same time? How many candidates are running? Is someone really popular or unpopular running? So it's hard to say, but it looks like it's probably a wash or a slight benefit overall. I, I honest, I want to follow up with uh, some of the points that you made, um, mm -hmm. especially about you know one community flipping uh, back to the original voting system. Uh, so this would obviously go to a referendum. It would be implemented uh, mm -hmm. if it's approved by the voters. Um, would then, if there are any issues in Evanston or Evanston voters don't approve of this uh, this system for whatever reason that may mm -hmm. be, uh, you know, would that require another referendum to then change our voting system back? How would that look uh, going forward? If you know, yeah, under Illinois state law, the uh, city council can it, it requires a referendum to change the voting mechanism. Um, and that can get there either through petition or city council. Um, <clears throat> so if hypothetically, I doubt this will happen, but hypothetically we have ranked choice voting in 2025 and everybody decides it's a terrible idea for some reason, we could put another referendum on the ballot to change it to something else. Um, so that's it's the same process to change it to whatever, either now or in the future. And um, let's go to this next question talking about, you know, if a voter doesn't rank everyone on the list, um, what would happen to that? Ballot? Is, it, is it thrown out? Is, you know, is it yeah. So that gets colloquially called an exhausted ballot. It's kind of a silly name. And at that point, that ballot just has no information to be counted. So we stop counting that ballot which is exactly what happens right now with plurality voting after the first round, essentially. So <clears throat> um, if you want to vote for one candidate and then stop, and that candidate doesn't win, then, okay, your ballot doesn't influence the final result, but that's exactly the same thing that would happen now with plurality voting. If you pick three candidates and none of them end up in the final round, Again, you got to express more opinion than currently and chose not to uh, keep voting. So it's it, it's the same as if you didn't vote or voted for a, a non-popular candidate in a plurality election. Uh, sometimes detractors like to say, aha, that means that ranked choice voting doesn't truly produce majority winners. It produces a majority of a majority winner of the votes cast for a given round. So if voter turnout in a district is 40%, then, well, a majority of eligible voters didn't vote for the winning candidates, even if they got 100% of the actual votes cast. So that's a, kind of a disingenuous, ar disingenuous argument. Um, but that, that's how that works, is we keep counting a ballot until it runs out. And, and I would say as well that um, it's not just plurality and ranked choice voting that have that issue. Approval has that issue as well. You can you don't have to rank or uh, give points to every single candidate that is on that ballot. You could just stop. It has the exact same effect as everything that Larry just said. And uh, so uh, let's go back to you know, some of the impact that ranked choice voting would have on, um, on Evanston um, and, uh, and what that could mean for the rest of the state, rest of the country in general. Um, you know, what, what do you think the impact of you know, Evanston adopting this and having it be successful, what would that look like on the state level? What impact could that have nationwide, et cetera? So ideal case, Evanston adopts ranked choice voting overwhelmingly. The <clears throat> people in the state legislature who are on the fence, uh, who think it's a good idea, but there's other priorities, take notice and start signing on to the existing bill that would use ranked choice voting 
for state and federal elections in Illinois. <clears throat> Illinois doesn't have meaningful ballot measures. So if we want it to the state level in Illinois, it has to go through the state legislature. But if the state legislature passes that bill, then that would, uh, when whatever the next election is, would apply to uh, state Senate, state representative, Congress, Senate, governor, uh, treasurer, um, and I believe that bill also includes uh, presidential. Uh, so it doesn't, a um, block, it, it doesn't deal with the uh, electoral college problem, but it would mean that the state selectors would go to whoever had a ranked choice voting win in the state, which is what Maine is doing now. So that's our ideal case. And then other cities, you know, either before or after that, other cities also take notice. I, as we, we say this, Berwyn voted uh, in a non-binding referendum uh, back in June by 82% that they support ranked choice voting and they want their city council to adopt it. Uh, there's movement in Oak Park that is interested in ranked choice voting. And <clears throat> um, we would love to see more cities, uh, not just in the Chicago area too, uh, but more cities in other parts of the state also adopt ranked choice voting because ranked choice voting is a genuinely nonpartisan reform. It you know, doesn't inherently benefit Democrats. It doesn't inherently benefit Republicans. It inherently benefits the voters. And it gives more voice to voters in the district to elect the candidate supported by voters in that district, which is what we want. And, you know, to one of the points raised earlier, ranked choice voting doesn't mean fewer progressive will win. Ranked choice voting does tend towards a consensus opinion of the voters in that district. If the voters in that district are overall solidly progressive, then you know, that would still tend to elect a progressive in that area. So you know, our, our goal is ranked choice voting at all levels um, in whatever order happens to work. And yes, as, as Jane notes in the chat, uh, there are eight cities uh, across the country now that are considering ranked choice voting this fall. So the, the movement grows quickly. I think just just in, in my role tonight as devil's advocate, or if you want to call it that, um, I think that could also be an argument um, against adoption in Evanston, should you be so inclined, that um, this is much more about um, a show outside of Evanston than it is a change inside of Evanston. The, the instances where you will see this are likely, you know, mayor when we have a primary somewhat frequently, I would say with that, um, at least compared to ward elections, but it would literally take a primary to make this something in your life. So versus everything Larry just spoke to about how big a splash in the ponds it could be outside of Evanston, that's really where the, the thrust might be. And that could be a knock against it here in Evanston as well, depending on your point of view. If I could respond to that, one of the benefits of ranked choice voting is it makes it easier for candidates to run. They don't need to worry about splitting vote. So it's also possible, you know, in addition to the fewer elections, therefore, <clears throat> um, or fewer times you need to vote, therefore more people are involved in it, which is a net win we could potentially see more people choosing to run because they don't need to worry about vote splitting or anything like that. And so we see more candidates on the ballot, which is something we do see in many cities with ranked choice voting. And you know, with no comments about any of our current elected officials, having more choice for voters and making it easier for people to stand up and put themselves forward to run for office seems like a net win for democracy. And that's at a local level as well. I see that uh, Council Member Reed is in the audience right now and he has his hand raised, so I'll give him the floor. And if anybody else would like to participate, again, that this is a conversation that we're having, it's a panel, uh, and that it's open for anybody to jump in, have a, you know, speak their mind. Uh, so definitely jump in. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Sebastian, and thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Garfield and uh, uh, Nick uh, for uh, the spirited debate. I did not get to catch everything, but I did hear 
something that uh, Larry uh, just said um, about uh, consensus candidates. And, and, and this is to me one of the uh, things that worries me most about ranked choice voting. Uh, you know, I think ranked choice voting has merits and I think it's something to be considered, particularly at, uh, 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 at the national level. Uh, but, but I think what we have here in Evanston is a really solid system that has allowed groups like CABG to see transformational change on the council. Uh, this is, I would say, the most progressive council that we've had in, in quite a while. And it's because we inspire, because folks uh, from groups like CABG uh, were inspired to run and win. Uh, and we were able to utilize the primary system uh, to ensure that. Uh, if we were to get rid of primaries, there would mean less opportunities for groups like CABG and other democratically involved groups to, to, to go knock on doors and winnow the field down to the top two candidates. Uh, Mr. Garfield said that it's a consensus uh, 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 system ranked choice voting, but it's not really consensus because if you're in a race where let's say there were four candidates or, or, or three candidates, uh, you know, all of the voters for, you know, everyone doesn't get an opportunity to cast a second ballot or to have their second uh, choice heard. It's only the candidates of the least, uh, it's only the voters of the least popular candidate, right? So let's say candidate A and B, uh, you know, are, are neck and neck with, you know, 40, you know, somewhere 45 percent of the vote, let's say each of them. And then there's a third candidate who's, uh, you know, coming in with 10 percent of the vote. But let's say, you know, candidate A was really the consensus candidate. But it happens that candidate C's voters would would rather vote for candidate B. So you can end up in a situation where you really don't have the consensus candidate of, of, of the community. You have the consensus amongst the least popular, uh, the voters who vote for the least popular candidate. And so there are a number of uh, benefits to this, or, or I wouldn't say benefits, there are a number of things that are interesting about this system, uh, but there are a number of things that are very concerning. And if, if you watch the research that was presented at our uh, council meeting where this was voted on, uh, a professor uh, 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 from the University of San Francisco, uh, 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 Jason McDaniel, demonstrates that this may have a chilling effect on voter turnout for the next few cycles. And it may uh, eventually creep back up to uh, a baseline, but it could have a serious uh, chilling effect on at least the next few cycles. And I think barring uh, some other issues with it, there are a number of uh, legal issues that I'm sure we'll face down the road with this. Uh, this could cause a lot of confusion for voters. Uh, if anybody would like to respond on the panel, you are more than welcome to. Yeah. So I I have to question uh, your description there, Counselor. If you have, you know, candidates A and B who both get 40 something percent or whatever, and candidate C who gets 10 percent, if candidate C's uh, supporters, their second choice is candidate B, then that means candidate B is the consensus candidate. Maybe not everyone's first choice, but no one no. was everyone's first choice. Well, well, no, because if candidate B's voters, let's say most of candidate B's voters said that candidate A was their second choice. And so their second vote never gets counted. Only candidate C's. So, okay. The situation you're describing there has been analyzed. And of the 500-ish uh, times that ranked choice voting has been used in an election in the last 20 years in the US, there's been exactly one race where that's been a concern. And as we said earlier on, no voting system is perfect. There are gaps in every system, but <clears throat> um, you know the, the failure rate for RCV, if you wanna call it that, is extraordinarily small, one in 500 so far. Compared to plurality voting, which is what we have now, um, which elected nine non-majority winners just in the Illinois state and congressional uh, congressional primaries this year. So plurality voting, it, its issues are large, common, and in your face. Uh, ranked choice voting, the edge case you described there is extremely rare in practice. Well, well, if I can, if I can respond to that because uh, you know let, let's let's pair this out a bit more because I, I analyzed uh, you, you all brought uh, the I forget maybe the elections director for New York in 
And when you analyze the New York races, where there's, you know, there are 50 some odd races where ranked choice voting was used in the Democratic primary, and one, this was used in a primary, so it wasn't mm -hmm. eliminating opportunities for voter engagement. So I will say that's very different uh, with New York. But in, in that system, I believe uh, there's only one or two races where the candidate who won the plurality in the first round uh, uh, ended up, you know, not being the winner. In fact, whoever won the plurality, every, almost every time, except in one or two cases, ended up being the winner overall. Uh, Mayor Adams won the plurality vote. Uh, many of the council members. And then secondly, when you analyze that data even further, what you see is that uh, when you get to this round two or three, in many cases, in many, many, many cases there, there were uh, races where there were more voters whose uh, ballots had been exhausted, right, and whose votes were not counted than people who actually voted uh, in those, you know, second, third, or fourth rounds. And so in fact, it looks like we were taking, a, in, in New York's case, and please, this data is online, so I encourage folks to go look at the New York election. They, they were very transparent with the way the system worked. You can Google New York uh, 2021 or 2020 primary, whatever it is, uh, and you can see the results there. And what you'll see is that in many cases, there were uh, uh, far more exhausted ballots than votes cast in those rounds for the winning candidate. And so, our system, our primary system ensures that if you go to the uh, uh, to the ballot box on election day, your vote will be counted, whether it's for the person that wins or for the person that loses. In ranked choice voting, there can be opportunities where some people's votes are counted twice while your votes only counted once and where uh, uh, no. uh, we get to rounds. Well, again, uh, uh, Mr. Garfield, again, if the third place candidate drops off, their, their votes get counted twice. The people in second and third place, I mean, first and second place, their votes aren't getting counted twice. So there are times when your vote can be counted. Uh, other people's votes are counted twice while your votes only counted once. Uh, and you may not be a voter eligible in the multiple rounds that come, unlike our system now where you go on an election day and your vote will be counted. I'm sorry, Counselor, that's simply not true. In a runoff election like we have now, uh, or like Chicago has and a couple of other districts have, if there's so five candidates- clear, We do not have a runoff, we have a primary. So okay. Let's use the correct language. Yeah, if you have a primary. If there's five candidates in the primary and you vote for the fourth uh, ranked candidate who then doesn't advance, then you had no say between those top two candidates who did advance. That's the equivalent of an exhausted ballot. If you choose not to rank more candidates, that is your right. But right now with plurality voting, you're not allowed to express your richer opinion. Ranked choice voting lets you do so. But even then, only one vote from you counts at a given time. That's why it also go, goes by the name single transferable vote or instant runoff. You know, if I rank five candidates, then only one, I only have one ticket only, only one ballot, only one point that gets allocated at a time. I can move that to a different candidate once it's determined that a uh, candidate isn't going to win, but there's, it's still one person, one vote. Now, one could argue that something like approval voting, voting or star voting is not one person, one vote, but it's still one, ba one person, one ballot. And so and that system is still, um, you know, still honoring that you know, equality there. So you know, to say that ranked choice voting is violating one person, one vote is simply not true. I realize I'm muted. Uh, I do wanna to go to a question that popped up in the chat. Uh, how is ranked choice voting explained to voters that only see it for the first time on the ballot screen? I know uh, Nick showed a screenshot on his presentation where you know, approval voting was stating, you can choose more than one. How does ranked choice voting address that? So I believe I had a sample ballot uh, in my slides. I might take a moment to call it back up. <clears throat> so, uh, but you can find them online. In terms of what exactly the on-screen instructions would be, um, that's gonna depend on the voting system. I don't believe the current referendum specifies exactly how that should look. Uh, that would be up to the county clerk's office and the manufacturer of the voting equipment um, on exactly what that language is. Which I, or just I want to interject right there really quick. I want folks to remember that 
uh, and remember the term self-executing. And uh, when, when uh, in, in, in months from now or whenever it comes down and we're having a lot of confusion about this because there's court cases challenging ranked choice voting because the referendum uh, was, was rushed through and didn't take the proper legal analysis. And it comes down to the county clerk's office says that, hey, we cannot implement this because this ordinance is not self, this referendum is not self-executing. Uh, that's gonna be the question right there because there was no ballot design uh, uh, mentioned in this. And if you Google ranked choice voting, you'll see ballot designs that are differ from state to state, from city to city. And we have not specified what our ballot's gonna look like, which could lead to a lot of confusion uh, on election day. Again, the, the uh, Lisa Madigan, when she was attorney general issued a statement based on a Supreme Court, state Supreme Court ruling that ranked choice voting is legal, it's fine. I, I didn't say it wasn't legal. I said that the way we did it was not legal. I said it wasn't self-executing. If you read Lisa Madigan's memo, which I have, and I'm not just quoting it because it's out there uh, to make me feel comfortable, but if you read it, it says that it must be self-executing and what we have presented is not self-executing. And that's the issue. I'm not saying ranked choice voting isn't legal or a possibility. So Larry, I, I, I wanna, I'll ask you, this is this is kind of jumping off of that. Uh, do we have any idea of what an Evanston ranked choice voting ballot would look like uh, going forward, or how that would be implemented, or would that just be left up to city council to decide, or the city's clerk's office, et cetera? That would actually be let off. <coughs> excuse me, uh, left to the. Um, the county clerk's office because elections in Evanston are administered by the county. Uh, my understanding, I, I'm not uh, an election attorney, so I, my understanding, and I will caveat it that way, is um, the exact design of the ballot currently is under the jurisdiction of the uh, county clerk's office and would remain so under ranked choice voting. The, uh, the voting machines used by Cook County already can support ranked choice voting uh, from the manufacturer. And my understanding is the county clerk's office has not expressed any concerns about their ability to execute it. Um, so the, the exact wording of uh, how the ballot looks and stuff like that is not defined by municipal statute now, as I understand it, it's defined by the county clerk's office, I, I believe. It's defined by, by state statute uh, okay. relating to municipal law. So it is defined in the statute uh, somewhere the ballot design, which in this case, it is not defined in any statute. We have another question that popped in here. Uh, do voting or do the voting machines that we use in Evanston uh, also support approval voting? I have no idea, I haven't asked. I mean, it, it's, off the top of my head. I, I don't know for certain, but just thinking as a person in technology, um, that's a software fix that that's not something that would be terribly difficult to do. Um, unless these machines are secured in such a way that prevents them from ever changing how they operate or something like that. But um, I, I just don't know, but I can't imagine it would be terribly difficult to. Yeah, I, I can say that the, the machines are uh, likely very capable of it. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just jumping in as a former elect elections official, uh, because we do, you know, for folks who, you know, voted in uh, school board elections or uh, for MWRD, uh, Water Reclamation District, uh, 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 Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, those are choose more than one candidates and all of those are tallied up. And so, you know, it, it, as Nick said, it would be a short software fix to just tally it uh, to, to an unlimited limited number of candidates. I would imagine so, yes, because we, we have uh -huh. races that already run on a similar system, uh, picking multiple candidates. So I don't think it would be that uh, large of a fix. Uh, but I do want to now give the opportunity because I think we are all exhausted on some questions. And I think we covered a good amount of uh, ranked choice voting and alternative uh, voting systems uh, this evening. So I do want to give time uh, for Larry, Nick, uh, to, if you have any final closing thoughts, uh, and then I will close this out afterwards. 
So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you for the spirited conversation. If this sounds good and you agree that ranked choice voting is a good way forward uh, for, uh, for Evanston, then as I said before, vote yes in November. Uh, if you want to help out the campaign and get word out, rcvforevanston.org is the campaign website where you can sign up uh, to volunteer, donate for yard signs and so on. Uh, that's F-O-R, not the number four, it's rcv for Evanston. Uh, dot org. Um, and, you know, let's, let's make democracy better one city at a time. Um, thank you, Larry, Sebastian, um, everyone that came tonight. Um, and on one of my slides, I spoke to folks being concerned about informed voters. I hope you all feel more informed at this point than you did coming in. I hope this has been useful. Um, and thank you all for coming tonight. I do wanna repeat what Nick and Larry said. Thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, thank you to those who submitted questions uh, and were uh, participating. Uh, and this, this video will be available on our YouTube channel, uh, as well as on Facebook. Uh, and we'll put this out there for folks to, to review because I think that this was a great opportunity for residents to learn more about ranked choice voting, especially how it's being implemented in Evanston. Uh, because often we can talk about these large scale changes such as changing the way we, uh, we do our elections and participate in democracy. But sometimes we don't often see uh, how that uh, impacts uh, us here in our home, in our community. Uh, so if you have any more questions about ranked choice voting and or if you would like to draw attention to any topics or issues, concerns that are happening in Evanston, you can reach us on Facebook uh, via our website and we can create a little webinar on it. We've done series like this before and we'll continue to do so in the future. Uh, and I do wanna also thank uh, Councilmember Reed for jumping in at the end there uh, and, and speaking and, and providing some, some context and insight from the city council perspective. Uh, and uh, I'll let him uh, have the floor for a little bit to wrap up. If I could, uh, yeah, because... just, just give a closing. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to give a closing uh, statement for this, which is uh, there's a closing argument for voting yes. I just want to give the quick closing argument for voting no. If you like the system that we have where we elected our first black mayor under this system uh, over Alderman Ann Rainey. If you like the system that has uh, produced uh, a council that CABG fought hard to get, if you like the direction that we are going with more progressive candidates, more people of color, this system has produced the most diverse councils this city has had. And I think we should not change course yet until we have definitive answers on what this new system will do. And I, I think this is likely to win at the ballot, but mark this and we can see what the results are afterwards. And I'm telling you, we're gonna have a backslide in progressivism. We're gonna have fewer uh, 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 stalwarts leading on the council uh, uh, to make our city more progressive and push uh, for, for more change and equity for all. Um, and so I, I, if you like where we're going and the direction that we're heading, uh, and you put in a lot of work in this the last election, do not undo that work. Vote no. Thank you. Thank you again for everyone coming. Uh, it was a fantastic experience to be with you all tonight. I know we're taking time out of your evening uh, and being on Zoom is not always some people's favorite thing to do, uh, but it's great to see you all and thank you for participating. Uh, have a good rest of your evening.